time, and this guy's got five things going on at one time, and, and they're, they're working out. I, I just can't do that, I'm afraid. Uh, a lack of focus or something, I don't know. Uh, to continue our saga of interesting or funny fool, uh, I would like to tell you a story. I probably Some of you would, would know this story, I'm sure, but if I say the word to you, Louis Kukela, does anybody know who he was? Oh, uh, yeah, I see. Okay. Louis Kukela, uh, you watched the movie tonight of the fellows who won a Medal of Honor. How many of you got to see that flick, by the way, that little video? I was absolutely astounded that that thing actually appeared on mainline television on ABC, and, and that's why I went and wrote him and said, please send me one. I was sort of mind-boggled that it had actually gotten through all the media censors. Uh, but uh, watching those guys uh, who won Medals of Honor, I will tell you, Louis Kukela won two of them. And there aren't a lot of guys who won two of them. Uh, Kukela was a Marine uh, sergeant in World War II, won both of his Medals of Honor. He uh, was later commissioned, and uh, he was from Serbia. In the old days, I used to tell a story, and I would say Serbia, and nobody knew where that was. But uh, of late, people know where Serbia is. We've at least discovered Kukela's homeland, if we haven't found out who he is. But, but Kukela, my father years ago, worked for Louis Kukela. And coming from Serbia, he spoke a number of Eastern European languages, and English was at least his third or fourth language. And so he struggled a bit expressing himself in English, uh, and he had a terrible temper, which expressed itself rather clearly. And uh, I can still picture in my mind my dad telling me the stories of Kukela down at the gun shed who would get angry, and he would get upset. And what he would mean to say in English was to come out, and what he meant to say was, before I'd send a fool to do that, I'd rather do it myself. That was what he meant to say. But it didn't come out that way. And so as Kukela would get angry and slam his fist down on the desk, he would look out and announce, next time I send a fool, I go myself. <laughs> so. Most of us have done that, been there, <laughs> done that very thing. And, but it was always one of those funny, sort of strange uh, characters that were in the core. And as I said, very few guys. Another quick with Kayla story was in basic school. Some of you will go through the basic school. He had, they commissioned him, and everybody has to go through the basic school of some description for the Marine Corps. And Kukela was in the audience, and they got up, and they were discussing how to take this particular hill. And, of course, this was in the 20s and shortly after World War I. And as they described the incident and how the hill should be taken, and how the ground lay, and they were give all the grid coordinate and when the battle took place and how the best way to take the hill would be. When they finished, this young lieutenant in the back raised his hand and he said, uh, excuse me, he said, the, the bush wasn't that dense on the right side. You had to envelop over here on the left. Because it looks like you can go through that, but you can't. They see you too quickly. You must go from the left. And this guy said, well, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but that's, uh, that's not the school solution. That's not the way, and it wouldn't work. Kukela stood up and he said, what you mean it don't work? I win a Medal of Honor for taking that hill. <laughs> It'd be a little intimidating if you were the instructor. Uh, <laughs> what you mean it don't work? So. I have another friend from Serbia, uh, a guy who is, I just checked on him the other day. In fact, I just saw him here a couple of days ago. Uh, he was uh, fought with the French underground and was later commissioned in the French army, uh, although he was from Serbia, and then later uh, had an interesting career. If you think, uh, I have a funny career pattern, you ought to see his. He was uh, fought in the Dutch underground, I mean the French underground as a Serbian ended up uh, a sergeant in the, you know, in the army at the end of World War II, was then sent to Saint-Cyr where he was commissioned in the French Foreign Legion upon which he went to Vietnam and was uh, left there the most highly decorated French soldier alive at that time in the French army. Uh, he then went to Algeria where he was one of the French Foreign Legion officers, one of 31 French Foreign Legion officers who revolted against the French government. Uh, 29 of those officers were shot and killed. Uh, he was not. And I asked him one day, I said, uh, his name was Sava Stanovich. And I said, Sava, why did you live? He said, they don't know what to do with me. He said, I plead guilty. 
And that was the truth. He went in and pled guilty, and they didn't kill him. They banned him from living in France, and he came and joined the American Army. And I met him. He was in the American Army and was in Vietnam with him on my first tour. And he was a character and still is, let me tell you, the First Order. So enough about Serbians. <laughs> Today we did a little thing, and I want to do a little review because it plays a part in what we're going to do tonight. I would like for somebody, volunteer, or at least a few of you, to answer these sort of notes and questions and tell me, what do you remember about David and Goliath? And I'm not looking for one person to... First of all, what, where did we find the story of David and Goliath? Remember what chapter it's in. Tell me some more about some things, some simple questions. How did David get in this mess? His dad sent him, okay? Uh, you may want to look a little further and, and remember some of the other things involved. He, okay, his old man wanted to sit rep on how his brothers were doing up there. Plus, you got to remember his mom was sending goodies to the front. That's, mothers are always good for that. Uh, ladies take care of them. Uh, and how long did he, how long had Goliath been coming and doing that? Ah, uh, the all-purpose answer, 40 days. But actually, it had been how many times did he come down and shout? 80 times. And what was his? What was he saying? And what do we learn at the end? about? Ah, uh, the world lies. Isn't that amazing? Okay. I want you to remember that. That's such a simple point and observation in that story, but it really will save you a lot of grief. The world lies. Magic news, okay? There's some other things in that story about who did David trust in when he fought the bear and the lion? And who won the battle against the bear and the lion? Who did David credit? Huh. And when he went to take on Goliath, what was his outlook? God will do it. <laughs> and for a moment, trust himself. Whose equipment did he wear? Yeah, the things that God had issued to him personally and the ones he was good at. Left that other stuff up there for, for Saul. Let me ask you a story, a, a quick question about that story. Why did Saul not answer the call to go challenge again? Who was the biggest guy they know of at that point? Who was drawing the big bucks? Who had the, you know, who had the Mercedes chariot? Saul. <laughs> He had all the bennies of being the leader, and when the challenge came down, who logically should have gone to do that? Why didn't he? I'll tell you why he didn't do it. Read First Samuel 15, two chapters earlier. You remember that story? He's coming back into Jerusalem. He's confronted by the by the uh, prophet Samuel. And he says, where have, you been go have we been, Saul? And he said, I've been out performing the commandment of the Lord. He says, yeah, that's true. You were sent to go kill all them people and get rid of that stuff. And all I hear is Barnum and Bailey up there. There's goats and sheep and cows and all kinds of junk. And none of that was part of the deal. You remember how the how 15th chapter of 1 of, uh, Samuel ends? Samuel says to Saul, does God desire obedience or sacrifice? And because of your disobedience, God is sorry he made you king. And then he says, and at that point, God withdrew his spirit from Saul. You want to know why Saul didn't go out and stand up against Goliath? He's no fool. He knew he'd face him alone. The 15th chapter tells you why the 17th happens. Scripture is incredibly logical if we just look at it, look at the sequence and the pattern. But that's what happened with giants. I'm going to ask somebody if they would like to turn to Numbers 13. Another little passage here. And I would like for you to take a look and <clears throat> get somebody who's got a good voice so you won't have to listen to me. I'd like for you to read Numbers 13, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. Okay? Good, got good, good man over here to do that. Moses said to explore the land of Canaan. He said to them, Make your way up to Negeva and go on into the hill country. See what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. See whether it is easy or difficult the country in which they live, whether the cities in which they live are weakly defended or well fortified. Is the land 
fruit or barren, and does it grow trees or not? Go boldly in and take some of the some of its fruit. It was the season when the fruit first grapes were ripe. They went up and explored the county, the country, from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob and Lebahamoth. They went up in Mecca and came into Hebron, where a man then died. You can see why I didn't read it. I mean, it's not very clear why I didn't do it. A lot of people were the descendants. Hebron was built seven years before dawn in Egypt. They came into the gorge of Eskol, and there they cut a branch from a single bunch of grapes, and they carried it in, carried it on a pole two at a time. They also picked pomegranates and figs. It was from the bunch of grapes which the Israelites cut there that the place was named the gorge of Eskol. After 40 days, they returned to exploring the country. Came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israelites and Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. He made their report to them and to the whole community and showed them the fruit of the country. And this was the story they told Moses. We made our way into the land to which you sent us. It is flowing with milk and honey, and there is fruit, and there here is the fruit it grows. But its inhabitants are sturdy, and the cities are very strongly fortified. And indeed, we saw there the descendants of Anak. We also saw the Amalekites who live in the in Negev, Hittites, Jebusites and the Amorites who live in the hill country, and the Canaanites who live by the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb called for silence before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy the country. We are well able to conquer it. But the men who had gone with him said, No, we cannot attack these people. They are stronger than we. Thus they report to the Israelites about the land which they had explored with discouraged. The country we explored, they said, will swallow up any who go to live in it. All the people we see there are men of gigantic size. When we set eyes on the Nephilim, the sons of Anak belong to, belong to Nephilim, we felt no bigger than grasshoppers, and that is how we look to them. Okay, thank you. Again, I will ask you a couple of simple questions. Do you, how many people actually went on this trip? Twelve. Tell me the names of them without looking in your book. Joshua and Caleb and ah, <laughs> ten others. When the report came through, who were the ones that brought the positive report and said, yeah, we can do this thing with God's help? Who were they? Caleb. And who were the ones that said, what's the message? They saw exactly, let me tell you, well, here's the problem. On the reconnaissance, they saw exactly the same thing as Joshua and Caleb. They saw the fruit. They saw the milk and honey. They saw the great uh, clusters that you could only put two in a pole. I mean, this is a pretty good place to live. They all 12, here's the point, all 12 saw exactly the same thing. But they did port the same thing. One, Joshua and Caleb focused on it the greatness of God's provision in this land and that with his help they could do it. And the other ten said, I don't know, looks tough. In, this, in essence, they conducted a reconnaissance. And again, how long were they there? Forty days, the general purpose, all purpose Bible quiz answer. And when they came back, ten men who were forgotten forever said no, and two guys said God can do this. It is imperative that we understand that when God sends us somewhere, very often we all see the same thing. The people who focus on the possibilities that God presents are remembered. And the people who focus on the problems the circumstance presents are forgotten. Now that's and let me tell you one of the things important about it. It's another little message I can tell you. Very often the majority isn't right. Particularly it has to do with spiritual things. Rarely is the majority the way to carry the day. These guys went out and I can I will give you a little insight <clears throat> and breaks down for you. The recon consists of verses seventeen to twenty. It talks about the people, the strength, the numbers, describes the cities. Describing the strongholds, talks about how the land is full of provision. There's a, then the report comes back and talks about the extensive food. And then it also mentions the tough walled cities and the gents. 
as you read on in chapter 14, which I didn't ask you to do, I'll ask, I'm going to jump on Bob Underhill because I know he's a wizard. <clears throat> uh, in, in chapter 14, they held a little conference. Remember after report, reconnaissance all took place. They held a conference and they sort of, what was the tenor of that conference as they presented it to Moses, the, the Israeli people? No way. Their consensus was they believed the ten, not the two. And did they have anything to say about Moses, did you recall? Yeah. Let's get rid of this bum. He led us to this place, this bogus place. We wandered around and around the, up there in the desert for a short while. We got here, and this was God's plan A, that they would cross in and take over this land. And there was a problem which I'll tell in just a moment, which we understand, but as it turns out, Moses, they challenged his leadership. And they considered stoning him at that point. This was a, dis this was a mutiny, in effect. That was the result of their believing the ten rather than listening to Joshua and Caleb. Now, the point I kind of want to make to you is that when they disgruntled, and they finally ended up, and their decision was not to go. You heard the reconnaissance and the report, and then this meeting they held, it was a disgruntled meeting, challenging the leadership, but the final outcome of it was not to go. What was God's response to their decide, decision not to go? This time, not 40 days. 40 years. 40 years in the desert. The purpose of that was to what? That all the people who were of the age of accountability would die in the desert. Of the group that was there, how many of those who were above the age of accountability went into the promised land? Joshua. I tell you, I challenge you in Scripture to see how logical, how reasonable it tracks. You have to think about it a little, but it tracks wonderfully. Let's go back, and let me tell you, characterize the response. Boy, the report was, this place is great. Land of milk, honey, big grape clusters, wonderful place. There's a problem. And what's the problem? Giants in the land. And at that point, I'm sure God said, oh, gee whiz, I forgot about the giants. Oh, how did I overlook that? No, I didn't want to say it at all. You know what his answer was? Of course there are giants in the land. I mean, what do you expect? We want a free lunch? Of course there are giants in the land. And why are the giants there? They're there will turn God and trust in him rather than themselves. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I tell you, it's very easy to figure that out. You can deduce the, the, the commander's intent very easily of why the giants were there. They were there, at, just as I said, to force the people to depend on God. And I'll tell you how you know that. Let's go forward 40 years. Joshua is now the commander-in-chief. They cross over. Remember that? They save the little stones to build an altar to remember that God done that. And they come to a city. What city is that? Jericho. Good. And is, what, what, is Jericho one of those tough walled cities? And David, excuse me, and Joshua comes out and says, and wouldn't you love to have been there that morning when he briefed all of his generals? We have got this great battle plan. I mean, it will be irresistible. Way they stand against us. We're going to go out there and march around the city. Every day for six days. And that, that'll do it. And on the seventh, the, the, I mean, this is the final, the final blow. Pardon the pun. We're going to walk around seven times on the seventh day. That ain't going to do it. What really is going to get them is when we blow these horns, right? And I'm sure all of them stood there and went, huh? He was in the sun too long. <laughs> Forty years. He made it in, but not all of him got here. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that he looked at that and went, this is the guy's a loon. You see, because what happened when they did exactly what Joshua said? 
And we know from archaeological study that they fell how? Do you know? They fell out. Nobody broke down the walls in a standard siege effort. Went out. And that's been established now in a couple of archaeological digs. That tells me that when they do what God says and depend on him, it works. And that's precisely why God gave them the giants in the first place, to force them back to him. Now let me ask you a question. Have you not trusted God, come right to the point where it's time to go do what he tells you to do, and all of a sudden you go, what about the giants? We all face giants. I hate to tell you this, but the giants are part of the program. There will always be giants. No matter how good it looks, no matter how many grapes there are in a cluster, there will always be giants. And why? To force you back to depend on God. Because if he turns you loose, you'll fall on your head again, dependent on yourself. How do we know that? After Jericho, what was the next attempt to do? Ai. And they went up to Ai, and they did a lot of prayer, and, and sought God's will, and didn't they? No, wrong. They said, ah, it's just a little place up there, Lake Town. We'll just dispatch a few troops up there and take over the place. Did that work? They came, chased home with their tail between their legs. Simple. Big walled city. Depend on God, bam, down it comes, we win. Little hick town, we forget to consult God, we forget to deal with him in detail, and we get licked. Could it be clearer? And yet I have to tell you, how many times in my life I have trusted God right up to the point that I needed to go into the promised land to reap the benefit, to live where he wanted me to, at at the level he wanted me to. I've gone, the giants have scared me to death. And I wandered around out there in the wilderness. Now, that was the worst compass march in, in 40 years. If you look how far they had to go, it was nothing. You had done that in no time. 40 years out there wandering around. Because God said, if you're not going to believe me and trust me, I've just got to make you pay a price. You might want to read, uh, I don't know where it is in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 3, 16 to 19, I think. Somebody would dig that up. I'd appreciate it. Read that, and you'll see exactly how this thing all ended and why it occurred. So those places where in the Old Testament they go back, I mean, in the New Testament they tell you exactly why an event occurred. And Yes, sir, go ahead, please. Stand up if you would. It's a little better for folks. They didn't believe God. And that's why they died in the wilderness. I wish I could tell you that I've learned this lesson, I've studied this passage, I've got it all together. No, but I want to tell you something. The giants still scare me. The giants still worry me. I sometimes react out of fear and I forget to go and say, God, I mean, how do you want it done? I'll do what you tell me. I forget to do that. I wish I could stand up here and say, oh yeah, I got it all together. I don't. But I want you to understand that God, these stories tell us things with real clarity in mind. They couldn't go into the promised land because they failed to trust God. And those of you who may or may may not know Christ, you're not going to get there by It is not going to happen. You're not going to receive salvation based on your efforts. You can only receive salvation by trusting God. And he's got a strange way of doing it. You come in and confess your sin and believe that his son is Jesus and was raised from the dead in three days, and you get in. That's his method. And you say, oh, that's kind of goofy. That makes sense. I can remember thinking, oh, that's kind of goofy. How goofy is walking around a walled city? How strange is that? And blowing them stupid horns. God's ways don't necessarily make sense to us. Sometimes they do. 
but sometimes they don't at all. And I continue to be frightened by the giants. We need to remember that there are giants in every promised land. God is not surprised. This is not a cosmic oversight. And if we'll face those giants in God's strength, using his, the day is carried. If we don't, we don't enter. We don't get what God has prepared for us. God is forgiving, but when we sin and when we reject God, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin, sin causes death. That's the way it works. Even as a father, when I'm in sin, it causes death in my own family. Let me explain that to you. When I've sinned as a father or as a husband, and I don't get that straightened back out, and I don't back and get back in fellowship with God, and in my stubbornness, I resist that. I'm afraid, and so I pull into myself, and I try to handle it myself, and I don't go to God, and I don't go and confess it. You know what happens? Spiritually... I spread death in my own home. I'm not available to my children. I can't help them. I can't help my wife and encourage her when she needs it. Let me tell you something. The wages of sin is death. Ain't no if about it. And in order to get it forgiven and straightened out, we must go back to God. We must do it His way. It is imperative in my thinking that we understand that Giants are part of the program. They are not an anomaly. They are there to bring us back to God. I want to tell you a, a little bit of a, of a, a follow-on to this that will be helpful to you, I hope. But remember, giants are normal. I want to pass on some wisdom that I learned years ago on the battlefield. And that is that leaders become casualties. We sit around and we look at Christian leaders and we see them fall into sin or struggle or have some difficulty and we forget that leaders in battle become casualties at a greater rate than the average person. Let me describe this to you. In Vietnam, at no time did the total number of lieutenants, corporals, and sergeants, these are fire team leaders, squad leaders, and platoon commanders, in the infantry at no time did they constitute more than 21% of the total infantry population. Yet those three ranks in the U.S. Marine Corps in one six-month period were measured it. Lieutenants, sergeants, and corporals took 70% of the casualties even though they were only 21%. Leaders become casualties at a greater rate, almost be casualty when the people rebelled against them. When you see so, if you stand up and go to... Uh, I, 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 let, me, let me put it this way. When, I, when I'm watching a TV show and I see a guy stand up and really give glory to Christ, what is your response to that? Hopefully you go, boy, that's neat. That's, that's a good thing for him to do. Gosh, that's great. Let me tell you what your response ought to be. Now, that's okay to experience initially. But your follow-on ought to be, God protect him. Because when you stand up on the battlefield, let me tell you, you become a target. Whenever I see some celebrity... Wherever I see somebody who's won some sort of contest or fame, and they credit Christ for moving in their life, some athlete, some politician, who stands up and really does what he ought to do, bravely name the name of Christ in public, my first response is, hallelujah, thanks, God protect him. I want you to picture the field and look out there, and when the bullets fly, guess what most people do? We always joked, and you know, you ever seen a entered military helmet? It's pretty hard to get a guy my size inside of one, but you can almost do it. When the bullets fly, you get down, and every little wrinkle in the ground is like heaven itself. 
Because I'm to tell you, when those bullets are skimming across there and you're down in a little teeny depression, it is wonderful. Because they're all going over you. The problem is, leaders don't get to stay there. They don't stay there. What happens if you stay down on the ground and you're caught out in the open with an infantry platoon? What happens? Pretty soon, they bring in the mortars. And the mortars don't care about the wrinkles in the ground. They start popping air bursts over the top of you, and you lay there long enough, and they kill you. you got to get up and move to get through it and get out of the area. Small arms hitting the deck's a good thing. Mortars, artillery, you have got to keep moving and get through it. Example. Corporals, sergeants, lieutenants. That's why they get hit so often. Life expectancy of a Marine Corps second lieutenant in an amphibious assault in World War II was less than a minute. Less than a minute. That's hard to imagine. How many of you saw Saving Private Ryan? There was a lot of hokey stuff in that movie, but let me tell you, some of the photography coming in showing those guys they were hit as they came in, tried to get out of those landing craft. That wasn't hokey. That was fairly real, pretty realistic. When the leader's up moving around, you're a pop-up target. In the Christian world, when you stand up and say, yeah, I'll lead a Bible study, understand what that means. It means all of a sudden you become a target. If you're, con if you're content to lay there on the ground at touch, as long as you keep your head down and don't do anything, you're reasonably safe. And the mortars come, then they kill you. But I just encourage you, whenever you see a leader or, or do that yourself, I would encourage you, pray for those people. When I was uh, about uh, 1992, when uh, the president came in and said he wanted to engage and open the U.S. military to the homosexual community, uh, I thought that was a bad idea. I didn't agree with it. And for a lot of reasons, some of them being spiritual, but a good many of them being simply medical. And a lot of them being involved with things that affect unit cohesion. And when somebody called me and said, would you come back to Washington and help organize the resistance and lobby against that movement, I said, I'll think about it. Foolish, I said, sure, I'll come do that. But as I got to be old and foolish, I said, no, let me think about that for a minute. And finally, I said, let me tell you what I'll do. I'll pray about that. And if my wife agrees, it's okay. And if I find ten men who pray for me to protect me and my wife during the time I'm up there doing that, then I'll do it. But if those ten guys don't step forward, I'm not coming. And that's a function of just getting a bit smarter as you get older. Because when you stand up, that's what I learned. Leaders become casualties at a much higher rate than the rank and file. When you take on and accept leadership in Christ's church, you're a pop-up target. And there are all kinds of things directed at unraveling you. Fine, if you're going to be a person in leadership, you need to find a group of that will pray for you and that you will agree to be accountable to. If you don't want leadership, that's fine. But if you accept leadership, you need to have support. Prayer support and accountability. Let me pass on one other little example of what it means to be committed. 1966, I was out west of a place called Tam Key. Tam Key was one of those sort of provincial towns, and there was a little valley out there called Minh Long. Uh, we had two battalions of Vietnamese Marines, about 1,400 Marines in the field, and a North Vietnamese regiment had attacked the town of Minh Long. We were brought in by helicopter, set in position, moved in as quickly as we could to try to engage them and hold them so we could bring uh, sporting arms to bear on them. They moved back rapidly, disengaged, broke contact with us, as we approached the valley, thinking that we would just chase them right on through that little narrow neck in the valley, as they did that, they opened up on us with quad 50 machine guns. Do you know what 50 caliber machine guns do to people? Bad things. 
poke holes in five or six of you if you're standing behind each other. And so our unit all went to ground, and they stopped a company loose, and I took that company, and we moved up on the ridge line to try to maneuver around and see if we could outflank them. In the meantime, I called for some air support. And the uh, Army had some longer tubes than we had, and so we asked for Army artillery to try to hit this grid, which they were eventually able to get. And the airstrikes came in, and it took us a couple, three hours to maneuver up there and get in position and for the airstrikes and all that to get right on the money. It was a very sharp ridge. Pretty soon they stopped firing. We put enough firepower on top of two rim mounts up there of quad uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and they had wreaked havoc in us in that opening few minutes. But our unit stayed in the, on the ground for two to three hours while that happened. When I came up with the lead company up on top as an advisor, I looked down and I couldn't see, and the smoke finally cleared, I couldn't see anybody moving. It looked to me like all of the NDA had been killed. So I moved down into the position, and I went from guy place to place trying to find and see if anybody was left alive. There were about 15 of them in position, NBA soldiers, and 15 guys that held up 1,400 people while their unit went off. They broke contact. Their mission was to contact, allow the, their unit to get away. That had all been set up before the attack occurred. So as I went from place to place, guy left who was alive. He was the senior guy. He was a sergeant from North Vietnam. He was from Haiphong. He was badly wounded. Didn't look like he lived anyway. The thing I noticed about them was that all of the NBA soldiers that were left behind there were all chained to the guns by leg irons or by hand irons. They were chained to the guns. I went to this sergeant, spoke pretty good Vietnamese in those days, and I asked him, what can I do for you? Do you want some water? You know, I, I had a first aid kit. I was perfectly willing to try to patch him up. I offered to vacuum if I could find a helicopter. And I said, and he didn't say anything initially, but finally I said, look, you're not in a position to hurt me at all. I don't even see you as the enemy at this point with these holes poked in you. What can I do to help you? You know what his answer was? He begged me to live. I couldn't believe it. He begged me to kill him. His answer was, my men are dead. I'm their leader and I have no right to live. I was crushed. I looked at his gear. After he died, his wallet was a picture of a wife, a couple of children, back in High Falls. But before he died, he said, kill me. And I couldn't. I said, there's no way. I'll medevac you. I'd like to do what I could to kill me. And I said, how can you fight for a group of people that would leave you behind, chained to these guns? How can you do that? And he looked at me, and it was almost a scoffing note in his voice. He said, you fool. You fool. You know why we'll you? We'll beat you because you think they locked us in these We volunteered to stay behind. We chained ourselves to the guns. We closed the locks. We threw the keys over the cliff so we wouldn't be tempted to run. You don't understand. You don't know what commitment is, and we'll beat you. That was 1966. Dang, it didn't. What I, want, I what, what I want you to remember from this story, when a person has written themselves off, given themselves up and surrendered, they're pretty tough to beat. I wrote in my notebook, that kind of commitment wins frequently. As Christians, do we know what commitment is? Do we understand it at that level? Do we know what it means to say, i got to die to bring glory to my Lord? I'm prepared to... Do we understand that? I mentioned, did I mention the story, and go through the story about the five missionaries that died down in Ecuador? How many of you remember that story when Jim Elliott was killed? And we remember Jim Elliott mostly because his wife could write. 
But there were four other guys. It was Jim Elliott and Ed McCauley and Roger Udarian and Nate Saint and Pete Fleming. That was the five of them. They died on the 8th of January, 1956. I'd been a Christian just a few months. These young men had signed on with various mission groups. When they got down in there in Ecuador, they found a group of Indians that no one had ever really reached out to. Some of you are old enough to remember they were Aukas. They had been headhunters and were still practicing some of that. They had tolerated no intrusion until who came in got killed. They did not let people from their tribe leave normally and live. They were an enigmatic a puzzle to people, and yet these five men God laid on their hearts to reach them for Jesus Christ. And they didn't just go, oh, let's go talk to the out. No. They found one who did, in fact, know their language. They learned as much as they could. They began flying over it with old Nate Saint's airplane, and they began dropping gifts to them and began trying to engage them in, in conversation of a sort. They sent gifts down in a little basket that Nate learned to twirl down in the jungle. They planned this thing very much like a military operation. I was always amazed at uh, how, how much they... Udarian had been in the, in the 82nd Airborne back in World War II. And so, over a period of time, they became committed. They called their wives together, and they said, here's what we plan to do, and they prayed about it, and they prepared for it. And in the back, all of them knew and they understood and they talked about, we might get killed. We might not get back. That's possible. And the wives knew that. Didn't think about it. They didn't dwell on it, but they knew it. And sure enough, they went in, and when they went in, they took firearms with them to protect themselves against jaguar and other wild animals, but made a pact between them, each of the men agreeing that if they were attacked by the Indians, they would not defend themselves, made a decision they would die rather than attack the people that God had called them to. This is commitment, folks. We have the means to protect ourselves. We still have family back there, but we're not going to do it. And sure enough, on the second or third day, I don't recall, they were attacked and killed, each of them. In the providence of God, there was an interesting assignment of the man who was in charge of Southcom because what was needed was military support, particularly helicopters. The wives didn't know if the men were alive or dead or wounded or hurt, needed, and so they began to look for them. And they needed a decision from the military commander to free up those helicopters. And you know who it was? General William K. Harrison, the president of the officers Christian felt was in that key job. And the support was lent, but unfortunately when they got there, they found five dead missionaries. I can remember as a young man thinking, that's tragedy. I mean, you got five really committed guys. You got five guys who are willing to go out there and work. Why are they killed? I mean, why would God allow that to happen? Let me assure you that the wives, possible their husbands to die, although the children knew something about what it might cost to try to reach the Alcas, the children were still fatherless. No amount of preparation would prepare them for that. So the reality set in. And I can remember in January of 60, 56 saying to myself, that's the goofiest thing I ever heard of. Why in the world would God ever allow that to happen? Was God on a coffee break? Was he not paying attention at that moment? And the answer is no. He was very much in charge. Hard for us to understand. About ten years ago, I was reading a study put out by the Christian Camping International. It was a survey of individuals who had been called to the mission field. And when they went through the survey, they asked people, what is it? Was there a particular incident? Was there a time when God spoke to you about mission? Was there a, an incident that crystallized your commitment to be available to get for the mission field? And lots of people wrote down different things. Do you know how many people listed 
the death of those five men as the critical element through which God spoke to them about going to the mission field? The answer is 50,000. There had been 50,000 young men and women, middle-aged men and women, older men and women, who had been so touched by the commitment and the fact that God allowed them to die. It meant so much. 50, uh, that was 10 years ago. I don't know how many that, that answer would be today. If somebody came up to you and said, would you, would you, would you lend me five bucks, pay you back 50,000? Most of us would think that's a pretty good deal. And what God saw way back in 1956 that I didn't see was he knew how it all played out. He knew how important that commitment of those five men, that offering of their lives would be. Understand something. That did not instantly mean that none of the widows grieved. That does not mean that the children were not yet fatherless or still struggling with that. Most of the wives found godly men who had loved them and their children. It wasn't all perfect, let me tell you. Working those things out is always a little messier than it looks, let me assure you. But the truth is, God used it to his glory. Let me go back and ask again. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Those men, lives, glorified God in a way that's hard for us to fathom. They displayed a kind of commitment, the kind I saw west of Tamki that wins doesn't always end in death. It really doesn't. But God is looking for people who are committed to following him, no matter what the cost. On the front, we often don't know what the cost will be. But I would encourage you to remember something. In the face of your commitment, in the face of your willingness to stand up, in appreciating the truth about leaders become casualties, no matter where God has the blessing for you, there are giants in the land. I want to stop for a moment and just take a moment because you've got a couple minutes left. I want you to think in your own mind, what are some of the giants in your life? What are the things that scare you? Don't have to tell me, but I want you to think about it. If you've got a pencil and paper, you might write a couple of those down. Stick them in your Bible. What are some of the giants that appear in your life, that to you are frightening, that are scary, that were in there on purpose to design to keep you going back to God and not relying on yourself. When we close in prayer, what I'd like for you to do is that I'm going to be quiet on the front end of this prayer, but I'm going to ask you to look at a couple of those giants and I'm going to ask you to pray and ask God to relieve you of the fear and promise to come see and talk to it and let him take care of the giants and when he gives you a goofy plan like stomping around the armed city and blowing horns at the walls and you go no that won't work you go well it did work and do what he tells you when it comes time to deal with them I'm going to ask you to do that and then I'm going to ask you, before you leave tomorrow, to share with at least one other person here what one of those just was and ask them to pray for you. You'll have some free time. But we need to recognize the giants, but more importantly, we need to deal with them. And we deal with them by trusting in God. And we trust Him best when we work with each other. When we help each other. One thing I loved about the Marine Corps, we never had one-man foxholes. Always two. And there's a good reason for that. Always two. When Jesus sent out his disciples on that first missionary effort, how many? what did he do? He sent them out two by two. He understands us. He knows we need help. He knows we need encouragement. He knows we need to learn to trust in other people as well as him. So I'm encouraging you now when I... Stop. I'll give you a minute on the front end of my prayer before I close to identify a couple of the giants in your life. Commit them to God and commit to share one of them with someone else that's here and ask them to pray for you. Let's bow in prayer.
Dear Father, we do thank You that You provide giants. You put them in our lives that force us back to come see You because we're quick to forget where our strength comes from. We're quick to turn to our own resources. We're slow to remember how many times You faithfully delivered us. Thank You, Lord, for the giants that scare us, that cause our souls to quake and to have fears and doubts about future. We thank You for them because we want them, Lord, to do just as uh, You did with the nation of Israel. It causes You to us to come back and trust You.